Hello, everyone, and welcome to Irenacast. I'm your host, Jeff, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Alan. On the first and third Tuesday of every month, we bring to you our perspectives on theology and culture from a post-evangelical lens. Thank you for joining us for another conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. This week, we are super excited for this episode. We have a third person in the booth, Austin Channing Brown. Um, she's a freelance writer and speaker. She's written for Sojourners Magazine, Relevant Magazine, and many others. And she is getting ready to release her first book that is actually out today. As you're listening to this episode, May 15th, 2015, I mean 2018, <laughs> sorry, uh, uh, Austin's book, um, I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness, is out right now. We will have information in the show notes on how to get this, and we will be talking a lot about that. But Austin, thank you for, you're our first, I, I'm going to predict that you're our first pre-bestselling author on the, the podcast. Yeah. So thank you so I much for joining it. us. Yes. Let me go put my little Pentecostal hat on and let's touch him <laughs> Hey. <laughs> nice. So Thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Um, just right out of the gate, like right away. I'm not a writer myself. I have to like preface this, but so maybe a pretend writer, but your use of like literary devices and metaphors and analogies are just like, it's a pleasure to read. And I'm wondering, uh, when did you start writing in general? Oh, thanks so much. That means so much to me. Um, I've honestly always loved writing, but I never thought I could turn it into a career. Um, you know, I was just a, a little black girl who needed to get a real job. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I never contemplated anything more than a hobby. But then this new thing called blogging hit the streets. And I was like, hmm. actually, I wasn't. Actually, a friend convinced me to start my own blog. And I was like, OK, I guess we'll do that. And it turns out I loved it. And then I realized other people liked it too, which was even more surprising. And eventually I um, had a mentor who, who said to me, um, Austin, I think you could write a book. And I tried. <laughs> and now, it's, now it's out in the world. Tried cool. is a dramatic underselling of this book, by the way. <laughs> right. It was like, like, okay, so I don't want to do the whole, you know, over the top fan kind of thing and just go through all the things that I loved about your book. But uh, off the top of my head, stuff like talking about stretching your name, like a cloak to, to fit even you uh, as a black girl, like just stuff like that. It's just so visceral and cool. I love it. I'm love the... so glad I, I told my mom. <laughs> so my mom and I are huge, huge, huge book lovers have been since mm. I was a kid. <laughs> um, <laughs> Everyone, we have a guest just in case yes. <laughs> during post production. If we can't get him um, out, just know that my son is in the studio <laughs> with me. We are my glad studio. To have him. I mean, living room. Um, so I, I told my mom, uh, you know, mommy, I, I'm pretty sure that like the content will resonate with people, but it's really important to me that it be good. Like as much time as we've spent in books and bookstores and libraries, like I can't, I can't write a bad one. It has to be good. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes me really happy when people say that they enjoyed the writing itself because I did, I did work really hard at it. Well, not only that, but I really appreciated the format. The interludes were some of my favorite yeah! parts. Just this, not, it wasn't even like a lull. It was this. I, I don't I don't even know how to describe it, but how like fulfilling and wonderful I thought those interludes were of just how it, it already felt like such a personal story. Yes. Um, yes. But then in those moments, it felt even more in the first one where you celebrate your blackness as a woman. Yeah. And then the second one, I loved that it was an inviting in of people who share your experience. And then, of course, yes. the beautiful letter to your son. I, I oh, loved those interludes. They were wonderful. Thanks so much. That was actually the suggestion of a friend. I'm, I'm telling you, a big part of the writing process, I, I would say, like, 50% is lonely and 50% is community. Oh, that's <laughs> you wonderful. Know? you got to have people who, who are helping you out, helping you think through it. And um, yeah, and one person suggested the letter to my son. And then I thought, huh, I wonder if there are other ways that I can include some smaller content, but content that's still important to me. So I'm so glad that that came through. Absolutely. They were they were wonderful. Um, so how uh, 
how has the the process been for you? So we're recording this a little bit before the book has actually come out, but I'm sure, sure you're already in the midst of just a whirlwind of, of preparation and anticipation for everything else that comes after. So are, how are you in this oh, process? Oh, man. I... It's such a it's such a strange process that the book is is being really well received, which I'm really grateful for. So like the reviews have been excellent um, and I'm starting to see the book appear in book lists that are, forgive the word, but secular, right, that are outside the church bubble. Right. And that's really exciting. But I, there is a lot of anxiety. Um, I know that I, I'm very clear about who my audience is in terms of folks who are already committed to racial justice or are sincerely interested and are sort of finding their way, (laughs) you know? Um, But there's a lot of folks who have, you know, listened to podcasts that have already released or have seen quotes. And and in fact, just today I deleted two things on Facebook calling me a racist. Um, So it's also getting ready for the folks who, you know, are not going to be as kind. (laughs) Right. Right. Um, So yeah, it's, it's a both and. Right. For sure. What I was going to ask was, uh, has has any of the reactions yet surprised you in any way? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so Publishers Weekly gave it like a, a starred review. And to be honest, I wasn't sure the book would make it out of the Christian publishing world. So anytime I see it pop up anyplace else, <laughs> I'm like, oh, my goodness, look, <laughs> it's my little book. I can't believe it. Um but then it's also gotten really, really good um, reception from folks who I just can't, I can't wrap my mind around the fact that they like know who I am, you know? And I hate to be like you use the word like all fangirly, but like Lecrae, like why does, why does Lecrae have my book? Why does, <laughs> why does he know my name? I don't know, but it's really cool. <laughs> so it's things like that. Like every, every time there's someone that I admire who, who gets a hold of the book and, and talks about how much it means to them. It's everything. That's cool. Yeah. I think you mentioned later in your book that, you know, your, your mom might've been the only one who was going to read it. So I mean, I seriously, that. like you don't know, right? Like you sit That's down true. in your home and, you know, stare at a screen and think, well, I hope my mama likes it. <laughs> Maybe she will read it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> FYI, she did just in case anyone is wondering, my mom did mm. read it. That's good. That's a good <laughs> sign. Uh, so I have another question. You describe a woman on the bus in one of the stories um, who finally speaks. She had spoken her truth, even if it meant hurting the feelings of every white person on that bus. And you kind of spoke about her like admiringly for doing that. Uh, and then you return to her at the end of the book and to that topic, um, speaking your truth and being honest. Is that what this book is about for you? And do you feel like you accomplished that in your book? This this book was a big project in me figuring out what I was willing to write down on paper. <laughs> you know, what is true enough for me to declare and write down in a book. And and I would I would say that um listening to her probably was the first time that I heard a black woman just lay it all out there. And then since then, learning about other folks like James Baldwin or Audre Lorde or James Cone or, you know, Cornell West, like ta Coates, just folks who continue to blow my mind as they think through racial justice and the beauty and wonder of Blackness. Um, and this was sort of my first attempt to do that, to tell the truth such as I know it today, right? So I'm still even trying to give myself grace for changing my mind later on. <laughs> this is mm-hmm. this is what I know today. But it, I, I confess to y'all, it does, um, it makes me feel proud when I hear other folks read quotes back to me and I still agree with myself. I'm like, yep, that is exactly how I feel. <laughs> that makes me, that makes me really happy. <laughs> You you also talked early in the book about how you had this desire to kind of be nice or soften, to especially to white people, your experiences and not. T- Do you feel like you did any of that in the book? Oh, man, I tried really hard. Yes, I'm sure I did. <laughs> but <laughs> but 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 I tried really hard 
to think about women of color who would be reading this book and identifying with the experiences and trying to put that at the forefront of my mind and then make white folks who are reading the book kind of secondary. So for example, like one thing that I was really conscious of was actually not defining terms. So I talk about white supremacy and white fragility and there's there's no there's no list of definitions anywhere in this book. And that's because I felt like if I did, I would immediately be centering white folks reading the book as opposed to other women of color, other black folks who will read this and not need a definition, who will know exactly what I'm talking about. So it's definitely possible that I watered down a few things, but I feel like maybe for everything I watered down, there's another punch in the gut. So like the first sentence, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> white people can be exhausting. You know, like I really tried hard to go there when I felt like, you know what, this was for the people. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to say it for the people. How long did it take you to like settle on that being your first line? That was the first line from the moment I submitted a book proposal. Nice. Wow. Mm -hmm. And according to Convergent, they were immediately like, yep, this is the one. This is this is the this is the next book on race we're gonna publish. That's yeah, really good. So that must be a nice burden lifted to know that you're like publishers full on behind you and and they want to embrace that message too. Exactly, exactly. There were um, a lot of publishers who um, were interested in the book, and I'm really grateful for that. But it wasn't uncommon for once we got into a discussion about what it would look like to be in a relationship and actually publish the book together. Um, oftentimes, there was a but you know, we want to reach as many readers as possible, which meant <laughs> right. <laughs> maybe we should tone this down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. For sure. And that's why I asked the questions about like white feelings is that that first sentence, you know, sets the whole standard for the whole book. Is it, it like you're, you're actually doing what you're like writing about with the book itself is that you are out of the gate saying like, well, the white feelings about my book are less important than speaking the truth of my experience. Exactly. So cool. I am going to re-listen to this podcast and steal that <laughs> quote. That is exactly, exactly right. So one of the things that really stood out to me was, not definition, but your direct uh, quote about hope and how you talk about, well, what does hope look for me? Yeah. And I think you say, you know, it is it is a shadow. And then right. going back into the beginning of the book, you talked about your first time being in a church experience where everyone yes. looked like you and yes. how they would preach hope and all that kind of stuff. And then everything in the middle feels like so many times hope is is weaponized. It's it's thrown in with like mm -hmm. unity and everything from places of power to say, you know, hope, which basically code for being, you know. Just stay in your right. place and do what you need to do, and we're going to move forward. Yep. So I was wondering if you, you would expand on that. Like when, when you think of hope, for you, even though it is a shadow, what does it look like? And then for you, how has it been almost used against people that you know and yourself as yeah. well? Yeah. I'm, if there's one chapter that I wrote that I'm still thinking through, I think it's that one, mm -hmm. the chapter on hope. Um, because I feel a lot of different things about hope. <laughs> so on the one hand, I really do believe in like ultimate hope, like hope with a capital H, hope that all things will be made right, hope that the world will one day be well, hope that Jesus is coming back, right? <laughs> like <laughs> hope. Um, as much as I want to affirm that hope, I still live in today. Right. Right. Like I don't I don't live in that post <laughs> the post world or whatever we would call it. I live now and I have been full of hope and full of optimism every time I join a new organization, every time I fill out a new application, every time I speak someplace, every, you know, like I'm hopeful all the time. But I know that I can also be disappointed. I've been disappointed enough to know that I can't just rely on on hope and good feelings and and let that be my fuel. Mm -hmm. I have to be willing to let hope die in this work. I have to be willing to face disappointment. You did it's that just for the readers. nature of this work. Sorry to cut you off. No, you're uh, fine. You, you did that for your readers too. Like you, you, you brought us time and again back to there ain't no friends here, like over and over. And I yeah. felt like yeah. my hope was dying. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, this is real. I was like, this is real. You know, whatever illusions that, that are created for us by society or ourselves or whatever in the book, like you slowly let go of that because you're really coming in con, at least for me, coming in contact with 
with that over and again is really powerful. Yeah. And I, I'm really glad that that resonated because, um, because that faltering of hope or the dying of hope is so real for people of color as we maneuver white ministries and white churches and white organizations. And I think a lot of white folks believe that they have arrived and that they are our friends, right? And so, and so that line was really important to me because I, I, want, I want people of color who navigate these ministries to be able to say, this doesn't feel like friendship. Like this. I am really disappointed right now. I had all these hopes in your mission and your vision, and I want to be a part of change, but this is unacceptable. Hmm. And da- and you even used the word dangerous too. You said it's dangerous sometimes for people to really feel like they're past their racism and a progressive ally. Yeah, to challenge that worldview of oneself can often lead to some sort of aggression. And we don't have to look far for it, right? Like, hello, Twitter, right? <laughs> like, yeah, right. Uh, right? Like, it's it's on display for all of us to see. But go to a workshop on race and challenge the most progressive who thinks they're the most progressive person in the room, and see how fast they become condescending, or aggressive, um, or mean, or just leave altogether and decide that they're not interested because they're not being affirmed the way they want to be affirmed. Mm. And when I arrive, I arrive to speak, not to listen. <laughs> exactly. I'm here to prove that's how much fun. I know. Like, I recognize <laughs> that that's, a, that's yeah. an impulse. Yeah. That's so um, one of the things that I thought it struck me when we got the book this week and uh, I sat down to read it and I wanted to kind of get out. So I, you know, probably went to the whitest place ever, a coffee shop, a bunch of people with beards <laughs> and flannel <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, reading it. And then when I got to the chapter where you kind of went through your day. And, yes. and up to that point, you know, I was having not the best day. And then I read that and I was like, what the hell is my problem? Like, <laughs> like this, wow. it was, it was so moving and frustrating the way that I, when I was reading it, the way I felt like it, like to, to have to justify in every little thing that we take for granted, your complete existence. And I was just so uh, moved and heartbroken and it, like it, c- confused and all this kind of stuff. And I just thought it was such a, a beautiful retelling of simple things that most of us just take for granted and not even attaching our, our identity to them in any way, shape or form. And then when you use that term tone policing, I, I when it, it brought back to that first line, like white people can be <laughs> exhausting. Like it was just exhausting hearing that. And I just thought it was um, wonderfully like uh, expressed. And yeah. uh, I don't, I don't, I don't really have a question with that. I just, I felt no, like I had to say yeah. that, you know, I, 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 I appreciate that it sort of like brought it home because I think what happens a lot is a white person is just one of those examples, right? So they're only the person who reached out to touch my hair or they're only the supervisor or they're right. They're just, they just occupy that one space. And so when I get upset or when a woman of color gets upset, you know, the white person is like, you know, but I didn't mean anything. I, you know, I was trying to be, I was trying to be helpful. Right? <laughs> right. And and they're like, how could you be upset about something that someone didn't intend to do to you? Right. Like that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Like I forgive people all the time when they don't mean to hurt me. Right. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the intention of that was to say, it may just be one time for you, but for me, this is my experience all day long being misunderstood having um, motives attributed to me that I didn't declare um, being tone policed. <laughs> like, like this is what I, this is what I go through every day. So I'm glad that seeing it, you know, sort of com- um, the cumulative, right. Of the day is helpful because I'm, I'm really trying to make clear um, that it's not just one person. It's not just one thing. And that's just one day, right? right? Now imagine that's, a week. Imagine that's a year. Imagine that's three years, you know, um, three years of somebody reaching out to touch your hair. Like after a while, you know, like, you know, I'm going to need for white people to stop doing that. You know, and and I might have a little attitude when I say it. (laughs) As well, you should. You did. You did talk about, uh, so white supremacy, not just being like this dragon, right. That you go out and slay. That's super obvious, but a poison that kind of seeps in. And you also talked about like, it's not the bad apples kind of thing, but it's an institution itself that is mostly subconscious. And that, um, for me, the most, I think the thing that just stuck in my brain that I'm trying to hold on to is 
white as default is bad. Like, and just kind of repeating that over and over and thinking through that. And like that, that happens whether people try or not. That's like, right. it's just what we're in. That's and right. So it's not the, it's not necessarily the one action, but it's how it connects to the larger thing that you come back to over and over in the book. Yeah. I, I had a moment um, when, when I was working at one particular organization um, where I realized that the way I pray changed because I grew up in a black church and in a black home where we pray like over top of each other. Right. So like, like one person starts praying and then someone else sort of like layers over. It's really hard to explain if you've never heard it before, but right. We don't pray one at a time. <laughs> right? There's, there might be the one dominant voice, but we all pray out loud at the same time, affirming what someone else is saying, or our prayers could diverge entirely, but we're still all praying. Right. Um, and we often will pray very quickly. Like our sentences are really fast. Like the way that I'm talking right now, like that's how we sound when we pray. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and I realized that I had started praying like this because I was in a ministry where that's how everyone around me prayed. And I would go home and would have to like figure out how to transition back into the way <laughs> that I had always grown up praying. Mm. Um, and that was hard. And so, you know, there, there are other examples too, but that was one that was really at the forefront of my mind because the culture didn't create space for me to pray the way I pray, you know? Um, and, and that happens in a lot of little ways. And so that's why I called it a poison because there are small ways that you get influenced by white culture that you may not even realize until you're back sort of quote unquote with your people or until someone points it out or until a friend looks at you and goes, what are you doing? <laughs> um, you know, and before you know it, you're like, oh my God, I didn't mean to drink the Kool-Aid. In fact, I've been actively trying not to drink the Kool-Aid and yet here it is showing up in my life. Wow. One, one thing we talked about off air was uh, you talked about anger as a tool and it's something, you know, Jeff said really resonated with him. Um, and something I've heard uh, people kind of rolling around, but I've never heard it really ar articulated super well. is like a theology of anger or something like that. Or like, a, yeah, I have a friend in ministry who, who talked about that a couple months ago. And it's kind of stuck in my brain. And then I read it in your book as you went from a place of anger being bad and something that you had to just like a skew or issue or whatever and push to the side. But now you look at, at it more like a, a tool or something to be used. For oh, good. absolutely. Absolutely. So if you had asked me a couple of years ago, whether or not anger is like good or bad, I don't think I would have said like anger is bad. Right. But because in a racial justice space, white feelings have a tendency to be the most primary thing in the room. And y'all may not have noticed, but white people often not receptive to the anger of black folks. <laughs> like mm -hmm. they're receptive to our maybe disappointment, maybe receptive to sadness, receptive to some other emotions, but anger is not usually one of them. And so I think I just inherited this idea based on experience, right? That if, if I wanted to be heard, if that was the goal, then anger was not the way to do it. Right. I don't think anybody taught that to me. I think I just picked it up, you know, and then there is this stereotype of the angry black woman. Right. That is diminishing and and makes it easy to dismiss me. And so I picked up Audre Lorde's book, um, Sister Outsider, and she has an essay called The Uses of Anger. And it was the first time that sh she brought into my consciousness how I manage my own emotions mm -hmm. Um, during racial conversations or during conversations about race. And when she, when she says anger is not inherent, like you, you, you shouldn't be ashamed of your anger. You shouldn't hide your anger. She's like, you just got to figure out how to use it. You can use it for destruction or you can use it to build. Right. And so she has her entire essay is about, it's really about feminism, um, but it's about multiracial feminism. It's about joining our anger with one another, as opposed to trying to hide it or diminish it or deny it. So what role does anger 
play in your creative process, like how you write and yeah. Well, the, I tell you, the first thing that I did was thought about my own life and how many things I've created out of a sense of anger. So I look at blog posts, and some of my most popular blog posts were when I was pissed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm so mad. <laughs> Um, and so I really realized how anger resonates hmm. with people, you know? Um, okay. Would you like to contribute? You're just sleepy. Yeah. You, you were, I don't know if we should sidetrack and, and talk about that, but you were talking about, so this is your son, right? Who is joining us for the podcast and you wrote about him in I the book did, and, and to here. him. And I wasn't going to bring this up because it actually touched me the deepest in your whole book, but I just got to say it. When you were talking about protecting your son when you were uh, pregnant with him, it was just like, that was just beautiful and heartbreaking. And uh, it's so weird to read that and then sit here and, <laughs> and meet you and see your son. Because <laughs> in my mind, like, because, you know, the book is a static thing, right? It just, it sits there and then I go back to it and now he's here. He's here. And you know what? I, I I don't think I would change one word of what I wrote in that letter. I think it really has become, to go back to the word hope, right? Hope of, of the life we hope to create for him. And so um, my husband has already introduced him to John Coltrane. Nice. Um, they listen to John Coltrane before bedtime. We've got a Michael Jackson poster on our on our wall. Um, and so every now and again, we'll walk by and he'll just take a little glance at Michael Jackson but it is fun to to slowly introduce him to the world of black culture, you right. know, and we're both very aware of when once again, our another layer of protection will be removed. Right. And he'll go to school and he'll, you know, he'll be out in the world. Um, but right now we are still enjoying his littleness and his cuteness and <laughs> and watching him discover all the things that that we love about being black hmm. i didn't mean to interrupt the conversation about creativity and anger he's just so cute yeah, he is so <laughs> and he's contributing cute, isn't he um so yeah so one thing that i had to do was just sort of look back over my own life and be like oh yeah this this is accurate anger is a part of creativity I guess I would have to confess that because like the book is written and because I've got this little one, there's not a whole lot of creative things that I'm doing right now. And so, and I'm trying to stay away from things that make me angry. <laughs> Quite <laughs> frankly, <laughs> there's so many things in the world that will make me angry. And I really just want to enjoy this time, you know, with my son Absolutely. and before I start traveling and, you know, all the things. So I'll get back to a sense of anger and really be thinking about that. I'll tell you guys one thing that I would really love to do is to have either either a podcast or a class that's just open to the community um, to talk about the new Jim Crow and um, to talk about race and blackness and the criminal justice system and to infuse it with like <laughs> hip hop and pop culture and other things about black culture that I love as a form of resistance, as a way to teach about what's wrong, but also teach about what's really good. Um, so that's something that I'm just pondering right now. I am not ready to actually do it, but, but sure. we'll see. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking about what, what I'm going to build next. Well, if you, seriously, we've lamented many times that our, this space in podcasting yeah. is, uh, uh, it looks the same <laughs> in a lot of different ways. Uh, we've it's coined the, very true. we've coined the term <laughs> bro mergent, right? So it's bro all these, a bunch uh, of white men with beards and yeah. So <laughs> we, that sounds amazing to us. I think it would inject some life into this space that, yeah. that tends to be, um, I don't know, our experience when we listen to some other stuff, it, it, it's, you know, it's progressive on the surface, but sometimes it, it, it either doesn't allow you to get below the surface or when it does, mm -hmm. it kind of reveals things that you're like, oh, that wasn't uh, <laughs> necessarily what I was hoping would happen there. And uh, yeah. so I think that would be amazing. And if any way we could be a part of that, just telling others yeah. about what Supported. you start, like that yeah. is that is amazing. That would be wonderful. Oh, thanks, guys. I appreciate the encouragement. Not that you have to be a whisperer for us, like you say in the book. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, but you know what? I really do enjoy enjoy teaching, right? I just want to teach on yeah. my own terms. Yes. You know? I loved that part of your book when you talked about being a teacher and commanding space in your classroom. And yeah. like, so 
I was substitute for a long time and I've taught and there was actually a sense of because of who I am in my body as like a big white man, yes. when I walk into a classroom, there's immediate like res- respect and like an, an, a recognition from kids and adults. Listening to you talk about yourself as a teacher was just it was eye opening. I that have, you could be um, different. You know, yeah, your, I have friends who are like professors who on a very regular basis, students will walk in and assume that they're students because they're just not used to seeing black women who are in charge, <laughs> are commanding this classroom. And I confess, I do understand why people are surprised when it's me just because of my name, right? So people expect to see you, <laughs> you know, they expect the tall white guy with a beard. Right. Um, and when they get me <laughs> instead, they're a little surprised and I understand that, but it, it is really, it is really difficult. So much of, of the black experience really is fostering a sense of pride and I know that pride, um, just being in white ministries, pride is often a bad word in white ministries, right? But in, in Black communities, having a sense of pride in who you are and where you come from, pride in your voice, pride in the things you've accomplished is so important because there are so many instances when that will be challenged, when your expertise will be challenged, when your person will be challenged, when your right to command a classroom will be challenged, you know? And so, yeah, it's just so important to have something deeper than the affirmation of students, quite frankly, because that may or may not come. Hmm. And how... And colleagues and superiors. That's and... <laughs> right. And everybody, right? I mean, Everyone. really, really all the way down the line. And, and how do you hope that not just your book, but you're just your work in general. Um, what is your hope for it in terms of creating space for people to be able to express, right? So almost the, the freedom to be able to share what's going on when society is kind of not allowed that. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. Yeah. So I really wrote this book with two folks in mind. And one is Black women, because I want one Black women to have to do just a little less emotional labor and explaining things over and over and over again. And if Black women can hand this book to somebody and be like, read this, right? Or if Black women don't have to come up with the language, if they can just be like, look, white people are exhausting. You know, <laughs> like if, right. they, you know if, if this in any way makes Black women feel less alone, then I will have succeeded with this book. And then the second thing that I really wanted to accomplish was, was for white folks who want to know what's next right? That they're already on board. They already care about racial justice. They're already occupying progressive spaces. And they're like, "Mm, but I know there's got to be more than this, right? Or I know there's got to be racism around here. Why am I not seeing it? Or why do I not understand? Like, I tell you, I had um, a mom, (laughs) this really cute white mom um, who had adopted two black boys and she comes into my office and she says, Austin, I, I have a real quick question. I knew she was coming to ask a question. So it was okay. She said, so, you know, I've got this teenage boy. And she said, we live out in like surrounded by white folks. She said, but I do make sure that he goes and gets his haircut in a black barber shop every Saturday. She's like, I, I got it. I know how important that space is. I know how important it is for black men to like, right, have their hair looking right. And and then she sat down on my couch and she said, but is there more I should be doing? Like, surely, surely there's more than just a haircut, (laughs) right? (laughs) That's the white person I wrote this for, right? right? Who was like, I've got the basics. I'm doing it. I'm here for it. I understand it. But isn't there more? (laughs) Mm. (laughs) That's what this book is for. (laughs) That's good. Well, it's it's working. I think, (laughs) frankly, (laughs) frankly, I think everyone should read it. Even the people who are offended by it. Even the, even the people who are offended by the first line, even people who are going to miss it, who you didn't write it for, I think they should read it too. I totally believe that. Absolutely. Well, as long as they talk to you about it after they do. I know. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we're we're There's both some truth of that. Right we're there. both in church work right now, and I can't speak for okay. Alan, but after reading this, I was thinking, how can I get this to more people? in the church and do something around it as far as conversation and just, you know, getting that book out there because I think it's such an important, because where I live right now, it's a very, 
it's a very white place. Like it's a it's totally. a central totally. coast of California and okay. there's okay. not a lot of diversity anywhere around us. And I think that it's easy for people to fall into that place of not putting themselves in the place to heat like here, not solve or mm-hmm. or impose, but hear other experiences that aren't their own. Yep. Exactly. And yeah. I think that this book is perfect. A lot of our that, listeners so. are like that too. They're in small towns in middle America right. where everyone thinks and feels the same way. And like, they're trying to get other voices to kind of open their horizons a little bit or start conversations where there's like nobody that's willing to talk to them. So they find, you know, online things. Um, I frankly, just to my confession, I thought about my church. I thought about this book. And the first thing I thought of was the people who are going to be offended. <laughs> and I was like, that maybe the maybe we should read it. Like if that's the first thing I think of, that, that illustrates like why there's a need for it, you know. Yeah. So I um I'm actually working on a discussion guide right now. I'm not sure when it'll be released. It'll either be, be released cool. this summer or in the fall. I'm thinking, but you guys, I think discussion guides are kind of boring sometimes. <laughs> um, even though I recognize their usefulness, so I created videos to go with the discussion guide. So what you'll do is you'll like gather your like little group around or your church group or whatever, and you'll play the video where you'll listen to me have a conversation about race with folks like Jen Hatmaker and um, Lecrae and yeah, just some other folks. So you can like watch a conversation about race happen and then answer the questions together in the discussion guide for that week. So that'd I'm be really so, hopeful, that'd be so helpful. That'd be right? I, I think it'll be really helpful for folks to be able to see the conversation happening, right? Mm-hmm. A conversation being rather modeled. than themselves, rather than themselves having it, <laughs> be able to watch it from like a watch a it distance. first. <laughs> this is how we do this, and I think it'll be helpful because it'll bring in stories that hopefully resonate with other people too, right? So I write in the book about how I um, have always grown up around white folks, but Lecrae, for example, grew up in the hood. So it'll give windows into other folks' experiences, right? And then Jen Hatmaker, what it's like for her to raise Black children compared to what it's like for me to raise my Black son, right? So it, I, I hope that it will just give some more windows and more fodder for, for conversation with folks. But yeah, be on the lookout for that. I think it'll be really helpful for churches who are looking to enter into the, the conversation. For sure. Wow, yeah. That'd... And then since you live in California, you should bring me out there. Yes. <laughs> That'd be amazing. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Yes. I'll get all my churches in the area for my denomination to put on a, I'm not kidding. If you want to be a part of that, that would be lovely. Bring me, bring me. Yes. You guys, this is the first time my little boy has actually fallen asleep during a podcast. Oh, wow. Usually my voice and he's just like, nope, I want to see what's going on and what's happening. (laughs) He has actually fallen asleep. We'll just tell ourselves that the conversation soothed him. That's right. That's right. Oh, he is. He's passed out. I He's love it. Passed out. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on this uh, this episode with us. Yeah, this, this was, was uh, so much fun. A, Are we over already? We don't, don't, we don't have to be over. We don't have to be over. <laughs> We we just want to be respectful of your time. So I was we, just we, saying, thank you. I, we, I can talk for days about this stuff. So seriously, <laughs> uh, it's so so much good stuff here. Um, can and, I ask you guys what your journey around racial justice has been? Because it's no. you might be <laughs> no, surprised kidding. to find that white men don't usually have this reaction to being told that white people are exhausting. So I'm just like mm-hmm. super curious. Was there ever thought of that being the title of the book? Just out of curiosity. No. Man, what, what <laughs> being the title, wait, what, what's being the title of the book? Why people are exhausting. Why people are exhausting. Discussion guide title, right? There you go. <laughs> hey, <laughs> That's hilarious. I was trying to say a joke while you were talking. I was saying no, no, I can't answer that question about <laughs> my process with racial justice. Man, I grew up in a small. When you were talking about your youth group, <clears throat> the like small or not small, but the white youth group that's listening to DC Talk and like all the different. Uh, elements of the white culture that you were a part of. That's my that, that's my background. That's where I grew up in a small white town where white supremacy was not only like the norm and the default uh, subconsciously. It was almost it was pretty much spoken here and there, like just affirmed even in churches, to be honest. And uh, so for my my progress in that realm has been learning to just listen. I mean, I, I have a hard time. So you said your family, they pray over each other. 
my family just talks over each other. <laughs> Everyone speaks. <laughs> you, you fight for your like, you know, chance to speak. So I'm used to like speaking over people. What I don't realize is because I am a man, because I'm a white man, when I speak over people, like it's not just doing that with my family. It's touching on a system that has done that to people for a very long time. And I'm just a part of that. And wow, so that's learning, good. Learning to be a listener is hard for me, period, but especially in, in conversations about racial justice. Just to be honest, Ta- Ta-Nehisi Coates is uh, Between the World and Me. I read it like a year or two ago, and it just – that was really, I think, my birth as a <laughs> as someone who's listening really? for the first time. Yeah. Wow. Like, like truly listening. You know, I, yeah, I have listened yeah. to, to individual people's experiences before. I have read certain books about like um, cross-cultural things and, and issues of justice and seminary. But I think it's really listening to people's – and that's why I love your book. I think it's listening to people's experiences of their world, of their bodies, of their lives that that does it. And I don't think there's any other mechanism for that. So Yeah. I do I think that's to... often a, a beginning point, right? And And then once you have enough of those collected, then like the statistics and the history and other things – it, it has more personal weight because you've got the other stuff, right? So now when you read, for example, the new Jim Crow, right? Now you've got more stories in your bank account to draw from as opposed to just like a list of laws. <laughs> it's like, okay, I get it. But when you can attach real people and real stories yeah. to what you're reading, yeah, it takes on a new life. Completely. Exactly. And I think one other moment for me was uh, I'm a part of the United Church of Christ and we had this uh, gathering where someone came and preached. I can't remember his name, uh, but he was a black preacher. And he spoke about, of course, the police brutality and violence against black men in our society. And then he's, he really got me into a frame of mind to think of until I see a black body with violence against it in equal terms as like the burning of a temple. I haven't really reached a place of, of transformation as a Christian. Because, you know, people <laughs> – I know, right? <laughs> this is something I've been thinking through. It's like, you know, we, we do believe like we are, we're the temple of, of the spirit, right? Like human bodies matter and bodies matter. And until you see like the killing of a black person as the killing of God, God's own self, like you haven't really arrived where you're at. And so that's been rolling around in my brain. And Wow. Um, but there's a really – I almost swore after you said that. <laughs> <laughs> But part of the question for people like me, right? And I can't, you know, I can't speak for Jeff. What do you do with that? If you just sit with that and then it doesn't change anything, it's worse than when you started. It's worse than not knowing at all. I mean, that, that's from the New Testament, right? Like it's worse for people who know the good that they're supposed to do, but they don't do it. So I guess for me, I'm trying to figure out <laughs> what my role is as a listener, but also yep. a minister. Yep. And what comes next for me? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, my experience is a little kind of on the opposite spectrum where for me it was experience, but I never had the words for mm. it until pretty recently because my context, there weren't any voices in my context. So we both, I mean, this podcast came from our our journey out of evangelicalism and to something okay. different. And um, we were both youth pastors within evangelical churches. And uh, I grew up in a town in California where uh, it was primarily Hispanic. So When I went to junior high and high school, I was the minority in most of my classes, except for my AP classes. And I I noticed that as I went through, like, why in these honors classes or college bound classes are we mostly white people? And then my other classes, almost all Hispanic. But I was in a white evangelical church that was separated from that. So there was never anything that pushed me beyond noticing that. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to college, I started working as youth pastor in a really large church in the middle of an area of... Los Angeles and congregation would come to the church from richer areas around. But then my youth group was all the students that were living in that area. So again, primarily Hispanic. And it was this, like, I noticed this, I don't know what to do with it because there's nothing in my context that's calling this out. That's saying like, this is a problem. And then every time I would mention it, it'd be pushed aside and be like, well, I don't, I don't know what to do with this. And then I got a job where I'm at now um, in a part of where I'm at now. And one of the, the striking thing about coming to this area was, wow, like there's a, like, it was visually striking. It was the first thing my wife and I noticed is all white people again. Wow. So it was this, it was a stark difference. And then, then I was introduced to things like uh, the first writings that I was introduced that really kind of started giving me words for that 
those different experiences was, you know, the work of Cornell West. And then oh, yeah. um, as soon as I started listening to a lot of like Mike McGarg, Science Mike, he was always yeah. listing, you know, great uh, other authors and people who were, and that's how I found out about you. Actually, I, so I started looking at your blog and then like two weeks later, it was one of those things where everyone was talking about your book again. I was like, oh, and then we got an email from, and I was, it was just great. Anyway, I love um, so, so all those things. So then it was like, now I have all these resources to put words to these things. And then that helps me kind of move into that action. So it was always, it was always present, but I didn't know how to articulate it because it was never, and it, unfortunately it was never a priority for my, yeah. my religious community that was supposed to be about love and justice. And that's, that's the most disappointing and difficult thing that I think I've had to work through is man, I f- mm-hmm. what a disservice to everyone in those congregations that I mm-hmm. served in. Mm-hmm. I I really appreciate y'all sharing those stories. I think, you know, I often get asked, uh, the question is more eloquent than this, but essentially, how do you get white folks to change? <laughs> uh, and I'm always like, oh. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think you should ask some white people. Like, I don't yeah. know. So I think, you know, your stories really mm-hmm. matter for other white folks who are trying to find their way. And like you mentioned, who feel isolated and alone. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's so important because change is possible. <laughs> Right. Mm-hmm. Um, within yourself and then within institutions, especially if you can find your community, you know, who's who you're learning with. So, yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. I really appreciate it. I think the two things I'm really like committing to and now I realize that I've already committed to it and it's important to say it out loud. One is supporting people of color and leadership in like non-token ways, because I've done it in token ways in the past. Like, oh, hey, do we have our person of color on set? But really recognizing that, like my community is actually lacking something Mm. when we don't support people of color um, in leadership. I love that. And I think that's one thing that I want to think about for my church in particular, but also for the other uh, organizations I'm with. And secondly, I think I need on a personal level, I need to actually check myself continuously, not just once and think I'm great, but on a constant basis of whether or not like I'm editing other people and their experiences or their, their, their functions in an organization. Cause you talked about your function in an organization, you know, the people in the boardroom think about, can our organization use this person? Are they going to fit into the culture? And like, I want to be a part of whatever I'm doing that affirms people like where they're at, as opposed to like making them fit into the culture that, that I've created. So constantly reevaluating is something that I, I'm going to have to do in the future. Oh, I, I love both people? of those things. <laughs> I didn't realize I was going to talk about that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have things to hold on to. That's great. <laughs> and if you're a listener, read this book. Yes. Just read it. Give it to someone you know, even if they're going to be upset. It doesn't matter. You Absolutely. Do it. <laughs> and we will have all the links in the, the show notes at irenacast.com slash 118. That's irenacast.com slash 118. We'll have ways, all the ways you can get the book. We'll link to uh, Austin's uh, blog page where you can find out more information and other writings that she's had. Is there any other way that we can direct people towards your work and what you're doing that we can, we can put in the show notes and just put out there as much as we can? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm only on three social media platforms. So Twitter and um, Instagram, where I'm at Austin Channing. Um, And then on my Facebook page, it's my full name, Austin Channing Brown. Um, So I try to post all the things on on all three platforms. And I I use them all in separate ways. But but yeah, if any of those are your favorite platforms, people, please come hang out with me. Absolutely. And I would say from personal experience, following you on Twitter, it's a great resource to just be connected. I I feel like I shouldn't have a favorite, but I don't. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it shows. It's wonderful. The conversations and the threads that you get involved in there. And uh, and not only that, but just the the, the connection to all these different voices. It's been been great. Oh, I love it. So we will put all that information in the show notes like we usually do, including uh, ways to get a hold of Alan and I and all that kind of stuff. So uh, get this book. I'm still here. Black Dig- Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown. Remember that title. Remember that name. It's going to be amazing. You're going to see, I'm sure, more books and more um, stuff coming from her as the years go on. Uh, a, a voice that is being mentioned in you know the same sentence as uh, Tom Hussey Coates and Cornel West and all these other wonderful, amazing thinkers and uh, man, just thank you so much for being on the show. It's such a pleasure to to read your book and then to hear from you personally and your experiences and your thoughts on, on some of our questions. So thank you so much for lending us your time and your story. It's so important. So important for so many people. Thank you guys for engaging this way. This was a really fun conversation and I think we should do it again. 
You are yes. welcome to come on <laughs> anytime. Are... Like anytime. We will Absolutely. drop our plans and, and <laughs> open the door because this is I agree, this has been so much fun. I second that. Absolutely. 